means to be part of a faith community. Um, started the series uh, last week, and a couple of have come to my attention that in some of my sermons that um, there are some people that uh, get kind of thrown under the bus, uh, some um, people that can't defend themselves because they don't have a microphone. Uh, a couple of Sundays ago, um, my wife is, is one of them, okay? Um, I, sometimes I, she's an easy target because that I get to live with her and I can go home and apologize to her. Uh, there was a, a, a couple Sundays ago, I was talking about, uh, you know, um, self-justification, about blaming uh, somebody else for your own stuff. Um, and there was a, I don't remember exactly what was said, but I do recall saying something about, uh, I can't sleep at night because that Cassandra is keeping me up, that she uh, is not letting me sleep uh, with Jace uh, crying and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, whenever you get up here behind the pulpit, it's sometimes difficult. Um, sometimes you don't know what you're saying. You know, you're, you get underneath these lights, you get a microphone up here, and sometimes, you know, most of the time I feel directed, but sometimes whenever I'm just, you know, being personal with you, I forget that I'm actually saying stuff. And so, uh, to protect the innocent, I just want to uh, speak to that scenario a little bit, okay? <laughs> Dear church family, I, Case and Oaks, apologize for offending Cassandra behind the pulpit. <laughs> no, she didn't write that. Um, I'm just kidding with you. Uh, but uh, it's a good day today, isn't it? It's a good day. Um, our church, um, I, I love our church. Um, we've been a church institution, Watonga Church the Nazarene, for 98 years. 98 years. You know the life expectancy of a church? You know how long that, that that is? 20 years. Uh, statistics in the United States show that uh, life expectancies of a church is 20 years. Uh, I know that that's kind of disheartening and that's kind of discouraging, but uh, I, not that there's any type of pride that kind of rises up or anything like that, but to me, I believe that 98 years as a reflection of that statistic would mean I believe we're doing God's will. We're doing certain things that, that, uh, that God uh, is honoring and uh, because of your faithfulness and because of our faithfulness to, in living life together that God's doing some good stuff. We've been in the series of how you belong and we talk about, we, I, it's my hope and my prayer that whoever comes to visit our church, whoever th that comes and sits in our services, um, it's my it's my desire, and I hope that it's your desire as well, that nobody leaves from this place without the knowledge that you belong to God. You're God's. You're God's people. And I hope that what we say and what we reflect up here on the stage and how we treat each other ultimately reflects your knowledge that you belong to God. Not because that I said so, because God says so. And it's reflected in our, our first banner of nurture as kind of a seed being scattered to knowing that, that he cares for you and that you belong to him and he is your responsibility. We also, it's also my hopes, it's also my dreams that whenever you leave from this place, um, whoever, if, you, if you're a visitor, if, you're a, if you've been here for 98 years, as long as we've had a, a church, it's... Uh, it's my prayer that not only that you recognize that you belong to God, but you also belong to his people. That you belong here together, that you belong in fellowship and you belong to live life together in this community. And it's reflected in our second banner, banner of, of nourish, that we nourish each other's relationship with God because that we're better together because we're living together. And I think it goes without saying that whenever we realize that we belong to God and we belong to each other, it goes without saying to know that we have a purpose, that we belong also to God's mission. It's reflected in our third banner, the flourish, uh, the purple banner, that reflects a... Uh, kind of a wheat type of, of, of growth, a spiritual growth that goes beyond just a single seed, that it, it multiplies and we go out into our community 
And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna be talking about how we belong to God's mission. And I want you to know that it's our goal as a church body together to be like Jesus, amen? I know that, that that might be for some of you whenever you hear that phrase that we want to be like Jesus, uh, was kind of involved in an interesting conversation where people talk about how church folks think that they are holier than thou because that they want to be like Jesus. Not to say that we've ever attained that goal, but that's our deepest desire. That's our, our, our highest goal. Lord, make me like you. And I think that that's a good goal to have. And I tell you what, that's not just because the, the church said it, it's because God said it. He wants us to be like the, him. He had put Jesus here on this earth so that we could follow in his footsteps and we could be like him. And not only did he send him, him here, but he rose from the dead as well to send his Holy Spirit to come upon us and live inside of us. And we know that the purpose in the life of a believer in the, for the Holy Spirit is to recreate the character of Jesus Christ in us. That's what we believe. Um, and so, uh, we believe that our focus is upon our relationship with God. We believe our focus is also because of that relationship that we should be living in, in harmony and in love with one another and that uh, we should be nurturing that relationship with each other. And today, our focus is on the uh, other believers as well. Uh, others that aren't believers. And so um, I would assume, <laughs> and I hope this is not a stretch by me assuming, that I'm assuming that my life is something like yours, similar. I've got, I've got kids. I, um, I've got problems. You know, I've got stress. My parents came over yesterday, and I took one of these... <sighs> And my mom says, what are you so stressed about? <laughs> and I was just like, well, I'm just, I'm tired. <laughs> you know, my, my eyes, I, I got better sleep last night than I ever did, but maybe there's a little stress involved in my life. Has anybody here not experienced some sort of stress in their life? You know, I, and not saying that she was, I'm going to have to pull out another letter, aren't I? <laughs> not saying that she was blaming me for, for not being stressed, but she was genuinely concerned about me. Um, uh, not that there was anything to be concerned about. Um, but um, so I, like you, probably start my day something similar to, to you, somewhere along in the morning time or something like that. I find myself absorbing some type of news, right? Uh, whether that you turn on the TV uh, whenever you're getting ready for work or about to, to leave from the house, you maybe turn on the t TV or hear some news or maybe that you listen to the radio and in between songs that you get a little synopsis of news and you're interested. Uh, you're interested in some of the news. Maybe I'm just making the assumption that, that everybody is interested in a little bit of the news. You want to know what's going on. As Christians, we want to know what's going on in our world and we want to be genuinely concerned about our neighbors, um, not only here in the United States, but um, I don't know about you, but I have just been overly whelmed with the news lately. I don't know, have you been? I mean, I've just been <sighs> burdened. There's this deal, uh, it's, it's been almost a month ago, about in a neighboring state uh, called Ferguson, Missouri, near St. Louis. You guys hear about the riots that are going on there and the, and the uprising of citizens of the United States, uprising against the police departments and stuff like that. And just been uh, unorganized chaos. And it just kind of been hurting my heart. I don't know about you. Has it been, has it kind of been overwhelming you? And so I've gotten text messages. I've been getting um, phone calls and conversations from, from, from you all and some people outside of our church saying, what, how do we respond to stuff like that? Um, would you pray? Would you pray for Ferguson, Missouri? Um, there were some other uh, issues whenever you turn on, on the news. Uh, um, Recently, the, uh, the ISIS in, in Iraq uh, situation where you're, you're literally seeing on the news, which I never thought that I would ever see, 
Christians being beheaded, uh, women of the Christian faith uh, being given over to wives uh, because solely that they are Christian. Um, it, it just kind of hurts my heart whenever I see uh, stuff like that. Um, and not to just mention something that has always been, I mean, this has been a long-term issue, but it just seems like that it's been more in our faith, our face uh, more recently is our border crisis. Um, I, I seen a, uh, I seen a, a news uh, feed of some uh, farmer that has this big ranch near the Mexican border, about 20 miles north of the Mexican border, and uh, and he is taking it upon himself to be the sheriff of his own land. You know, he rides his ranger around his land, and he's helping, um, he's helping uh, the border initiative and, uh, and, and trying to make citizens arrest and stuff like that. But beyond that, what do you do, as, as Christian people, what do you do with the hundreds of thousands of children Orphan children that cross without parents into the United States. What do you do with those children? What is our Christian response to that? Um, we have uh, the Nazarene Church, an influence in El Paso, Texas right now. We have a border response team um, and their mission is not to deport people. I don't want you to, to hear that. Their mission is to tend and care for the needs of those particular children in El Paso, Texas. And they are housing uh, thousands of children and trying to help them and nourish them uh, in, in, in a holistic manner. And I appreciate the Church of the Nazarene for doing that. But whenever you hear all of the news and that you're kind of overwhelmed with this news that is going on, it's my assumption that whenever I get text messages and emails from you all and, and phone calls and conversations that, that kind of turn political at some uh, times that I get that your response is that you are not satisfied by crossing your arms and just saying, it's a sad world we live in. You know, it's pathetic. I, I feel like... It, it, that we are not just satisfied as we look at our world to be crossing our arms and just saying it's pathetic. Um, and from some of the responses that I've got from, from certain people, I don't think that, they, uh, that you um, are just <laughs> happy and satisfied with me saying, let's pray about it, either. Um, I believe people calls. People, people are called. That God calls people that whenever there are things that break our hearts, God begins to call people in the places that may, maybe make us feel uncomfortable. Um, I was telling, Veronica is living with us. Um, she didn't know I was going to talk about her either. I'll, I'll write a letter later. Letter, later. Um, um, she does this thing that I think is kind of funny that uh, she washes her hair every other day. She doesn't wash it every day. And every other day that she is not getting herself in the shower and washing her ha hair, she uses the spray-on shampoo. And so um, she's the first uh, bedroom as you walk down the hall of the parsonage. And you know, I look in there and she's at the, the foot of her bed and she's doing this. And I think that she's itching her head. You know, and it, and it reminds me, I'm thinking... Veronica, do you have a problem with lice in there? I mean, what's the deal? And it, and it takes me back to a, a place of, of, a, of a girl that was from Bethany First Church. That she got called to go to uh, Calcutta. Um, one of the most poverty um, eastern cities. And she writes in her blog, uh, she talks about how now that she's been there for over two years, she talks about how that she... She fails to even remember what a warm shower looks like. She fails to remember how uh, a warm shower is, is, is a luxury to her, that she's just glad that she gets to have running water upon her. And she says, I've just now gotten over the fact that I, until the, the, that we have access to better um, um, 
hair care products. I'm just going to be satisfied with lice that continue to squirm in my hair. And uh, where she, what, she, what this girl is doing is that she is, uh, uh, she's working with children, which every single child uh, that she works with has head lice. And, uh, and so she believes that it's, it's, it's kind of part of the mission that God has called her to. Uh, she's from Oklahoma City. Girl that is uh, used to warm showers, is used to not having lice make a home in her head. <laughs> God is called to a place in Calcutta. This might not strike it to you as it has been st struck to me. Just thinking, God still calls people. And I, as simple as that might be, God still calls people. And you can take that for what it's worth. But there is a burden that has been placed upon my heart just recently. I think that it's, uh, his name's Bobby. Um, you might help me out here. Um, he's from this church. He's a pastor in, in Colorado. Bobby Howard. It's easily on your tongue. Bobby Howard is a product of this church. And you know that Bobby Howard is the last person that we have equipped that God has called from this church as a product of this church to be sent into a mission field as an ordained minister. How long ago was that, people? Help me out here. When was that, that, that Bobby uh, graduated from high school? Anybody remember? 20 years ago, maybe? Um, God has been doing something special in our church. Um, some people that are, are actively involved get to see people uh, coming to the altars and praying. And we've got some, we've got some teenagers here uh, that are a product of an eva evangelist that came into our town and came to me this morning excited about getting baptized in two Sundays. It's exciting. It should excite you. Uh, God's doing good things, but my, my, the burden that, that God is laying upon my heart, I didn't, I didn't prepare this at all, but the burden that God is laying upon my heart is that for God to call someone out of the ministry that we are doing to extend themselves as we train them up in discipleship, that they decide to go and train themselves to be a, a minister or a missionary of some sort. I believe this church uh, is equipped to do that. Do you agree with me? I think that people, if you open yourself up, there's going to be somebody here <laughs> in our congregation that God is going to call to that particular place. Would you take out a Bible with me and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? In this chapter, as you're turning there, in that chapter, Paul gives us a very clear picture of how we are to respond to our world and what we have to offer. Um, would you say to your neighbor, I don't normally do this, but would you say to your neighbor, I've got something to offer to my world? Look at your neighbor and say, I've got something to offer to my world. Now that you've practiced up, would you look to your other neighbor and would you say with confidence and that you actually believe it? <laughs> I've got something to offer to this world. Basically, he says in this passage of scripture that we now are new creations. And in that phrase... There is a phrase, or in, that passage, in this passage of scripture, there is a phrase that is very crucial to Paul's theology, and it's two words, in Christ. Really, nothing else that Paul says would even make sense or even matter to us if he did not use these two words, in Christ. Meaning that we were once in Christ, but now we once weren't in Christ, but now that we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And what he is saying here is that whenever, not only is the, the old gone and the new has come, that we look at our world completely different now. Because the old is gone, the new has come. 
Not only do we look at our world a completely different way, we look at each other differently. differently. We see each other differently. Now that we are in Christ, and I hope you, 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 you uh, folks that are making decisions for Christ on a regular basis begin to see this on a regular basis, that you once regarded people a certain way, now you see people a little bit differently because now you've got the in Christ factor. Christ has changed you, the old is gone, the new has come. We don't judge people from a worldly standpoint anymore. We don't look at that because we don't see people from the world as the world sees people. We see people differently because we are in Christ, not because they have a certain social stature, not because that they have wealth or because they have lack of wealth, not because of, of certain hairstyles or, or certain pairs of pants that they wear. You know, we don't see people or judge people based upon their outward appearance. We look at the world and we see the world differently. And Paul says, we see people differently and we who are in Christ have been committed have been given this ministry of reconciliation. We have been given, or in other terms, we have been committed to, commissioned to this ministry of reconciliation. Um, we have this opportunity, in other words, we have this opportunity that we have in ourselves because that we find ourselves in Christ. We have this opportunity to offer our neighbors to offer men, women, children a right relationship with God. We are ministers of reconciliation and we have been given the opportunity to give other people righteousness. Yes, it is God that gives righteousness. It is God that commissions people, but it is God that has commissioned us to offer this to people, to show people the way. So those who are in Christ, we see people differently. So God gave us this ministry, which means that we can offer people a right relationship with God. Would you uh, turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, and I'm going to start with verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 16. If you don't have your Bibles, it's on the screen. Thank you, Tyler, again for doing that uh, this morning. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, and let me stop right there. It says, though we once regarded Christ in this way, Paul is saying this from experience. Paul, somebody that wanted to wipe Jesus' name off the face of the earth. That's what he felt like God had commissioned him to. And now what he's saying is that he used to regard Christ this way. Christ has changed his perspective. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, from a worldly point of view, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, say, in Christ. He is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Re Notice what he doesn't say here. Notice that he doesn't say that Christ needed reconciled to us. <laughs> I, I don't know if you find that interesting or not, but it's us that needed reconciled to God because of our sin. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Say, in Christ. <laughs> Not counting men's sins against them. He is committed to us. He is committed to you. He is committed to me, the message of reconciliation. We, therefore, we are Christ ambassadors. And though God were making his appeal through us, we implore to you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become his righteousness. Sound familiar? The song that we sang this morning. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. You know that sometimes that... Uh, Songs that are not in hymnals actually 
are scriptural. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate that. I think that that lined up really well with what we're talking about today. So let me ask your que question. Let me just throw it out there. I'm not going to spend very much time this morning. Because I think that Paul makes this very clear. I let the word speak for itself. Um, do you see yourself as a new creation? The old is gone, the new has come, and I don't think that I used to think. <laughs> I think differently now. I don't look at look things the way that I, I used to look at them from a different perspective. I've been given this ministry of reconciliation because that's what my life is all about. I have this opportunity to share with people that they can have a right relationship with God and they can, can become righteous. Is that how you see your life? I have a feeling in this room that there are some of you saying, yes, I believe that that's me, that's my life. I believe that I've got that ministry and I believe that God has called me that, to that. Um, I might, maybe uh, some of you might be surprised that you believe that way even. Uh, but not sure if you feel that way about yourself. That's for somebody else, not for me. Because I know me, and that's just not me. <laughs> Let me try to make this real clear, okay? Uh, clearer. Does anybody here have actually folding money with them? Um, does anybody here have either a change for a 10 or a 20? No, no, not not enough. I, I I need I need change for two tens. All right, Bob, would you would you either give that to somebody or come up here and help me out? Um, you. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll, I've got a twenty here. You got two tens. Yeah, a ten, five ones, and five. No, oh, jeez. Six ones. Okay. All right. So I've got a twenty dollar bill here, and you've got. How much money there? 20. It's 20? Okay. I'm going to give that 20 to you, Bob. Would you give that to me? And we have just exchanged money. Okay, let me, let me just make sure. 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 20, okay. Got 20. Are we good? We're good. We're good, okay? You don't, you're not going to go sit by your wife and feel like that I just cheated you, right? She's going to want part of that. Probably all of this. <laughs> okay. Okay, just for lack of the illustration, we'll just say that we exchanged that. And you, oh. Sorry. Well, grab your money, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So Bob didn't walk away here feeling cheated out because we, uh, we exchanged goods, right? We exchanged uh, money. And, and that's what this reconciliation word actually means. Now, the word is called katalosso. That's the Greek word. You guys want to write that down because um, I probably won't use that word ever again in my lifetime because I've, I looked up the Greek word for this particular sermon. But the, that's what the word, it, the reconciliation, it's an exchanging of money for an equivalent amount. If there's something that needs to be ex exchanged, it's this price for this price. And so uh, we are reconciled. There's no difference between Bob and I. Our debt has been paid. We've exchanged this, and there are, there's no deficit between us. We're good. He can't hold money over my head. I can't hold money over his head. Um, if you can grasp that idea, then the idea of reconciliation can be very clear to you. Because what happens uh, to you is this mathematical concept of cataloso. You can say it under your breath because it's fun to say cataloso. <laughs> um, this exchanging money for the equivalent amount. Then it's being applied outside of the financial and outside the financial that's being applied to the relational. Those that are in a relationship, there is a, a sense of cataloso that eliminates the differences or the deficit between in relationships. So, um, so if you and I get right with each other, we're involved in cataloso. So use that sometime whenever you spouses that uh, go home and you guys have arguments and then you guys make up the difference of what is being lost in the midst of that, that argument. Say, honey, we just experienced cataloso. <laughs> Who's going to do that? Uh, nobody. Okay. Um, 
So we've got this idea. So this was, that, that was the concept in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, what we find in this passage of Scripture, this language where God has reconciled us to himself, there was a deficit, there was a difference, and that difference was sin. It was that we needed reconciled to God. We had this negative deficit, and what was that? It was sin. So that through Christ Jesus, he reconciles us to him, and the Bible clearly says that he does not count our sins against us. That's pretty powerful. I, I, it's not because I said so. It's just because the scripture said so, and I could just say, that's good stuff. That's good preaching because not, that's not me. Um, but you better hang on because here we go. There's a response to that. Our sins have not been counted against us, Paul says that he has given us Christ Jesus because we find ourselves reconciled to God. He has given us, he has commissioned us this ministry of reconciliation. He's given you a ministry. Now I have a feeling here this morning, some of you are saying, I didn't want one. <laughs> I didn't want a ministry. You got one anyway. If you find yourself in Christ, he has given each and every one of us a ministry, and that's called the ministry of reconciliation. You know what Paul is saying? He's saying you belong to a mission. That's not what I'm saying. That's what God is saying. <coughs> you belong to God. You belong to God's people. You belong to God's mission. I don't know if you guys get uh, letters or not like this in, in email, um, but every once in a while I want to find an email that I kind of chuckle at a little bit. And I got kind of excited about this email, okay? This is what this email says, and I listen very closely, okay? Dear Mr. Oaks, I like that. I am a personal attorney to the late Mr. Andre Oaks. Andre is the associate of Shell Oil Company and was an ambassador to Lome, Togo in Africa. On April 21st, 2008, our client died. Since that time, we have made several inquiries to your embassy to contact any extended relative, relatives. It is proven unsuccessful. I have contacted you to assist in relocating the fund value of 15 point million dollars left behind by our client. Why are you chuckling? <laughs> the bank has issued us to notice and provide this to the next of kin. Since we've been unable to do so for years now, I consent to you to present to you as his next of kin, because you have the same family name. All right, that's all that I had to do is just have the same last name of this guy. So, the amounts can be paid to you. All we require of you is your honest consent. How nice. So, if you're interested, if I'm interested, yeah, I'm interested, please reply, and they sign their name. Dad, You've been doing this family tree thing. Would you find an Andre Oaks for me so we can be millionaires? Okay. Why is that funny to you guys? I mean, why is it? It's funny because it's fake. It's a scam. And what probably happens is if I reply, they'll send a reply back. Okay, send $10,000 just to get the ball rolling. Has anybody else received mail or emails like that before? Yeah, I, I've got it as well. A little bit skeptical. So this guy is, is a representation of Andre Oaks. Um, Andre. Sounds like a family name, doesn't it? <laughs> um, we laugh at that because it's a scam, but this guy is representing what he's saying is representing somebody. Now, I don't know if Andre is real or not. Um, but he's representing Andre. Do you know that you are a representative? You, the word that scripture uses here is the word ambassador. And uh, an ambassador is a diplomat from another country of highest rank that represents another country that lives in a different country. And so he speaks on that country's behalf. 
And he has given you this ministry and you are an ambassador. You're an ambassador of the kingdom of God. Your citizenship, you represent, you here on this earth, you are. You're citizens of Watonga, some of you uh, Okeen, some of you Weatherford, some of you um, different places, um, Hitchcock, um, some of you from different places. You are citizens, but you're in a foreign country because your citizenship is not permanently here. You are citizens of the kingdom of God. You're just an ambassador living in a foreign country. I like that. I like that God has made me and you an ambassador. We're here in the United States, but we're just ambassadors. Yes, we are legal citizens of the United States, but we are actual citizens of the kingdom of God. So what does it look like, the ministry of reconciliation, ambassadors to the kingdom of God, what does that look like in the Watonga Church of the Nazarene? A couple of weeks ago, we, we asked you to bring your, your uh, change up for, an, uh, uh, for the alabaster offering. And, the, and we, uh, what, was the, what was the amount here? Um, it, was, it was close to $1,000 between um, September or in the spring to now. Uh, Joan's like, no, it wasn't. But we, between, for this fiscal year, we've raised over $1,000 for an alabaster offering, and we are part of a $30 million Church of the Nazarene project that's building houses and churches. We're doing stuff. We're being a, a part of the kingdom of God. Do you know that upon the, the tithes that the church, the, the Nazarene brings, you folks, we, uh, we pay missionary budgets and that is equivalent to almost $13,000 a year that we send out and we're doing things as mission projects. From, that's just Watonga, Oklahoma. That, but we don't, we don't necessarily get to see the benefits that are going overseas, that are going over and, and doing something that we don't necessarily get to see the benefits from. We've been talking about uh, in, in the first Sunday of October having a church meeting about building a building and there has been this, this, this burden upon uh, the church board that's sometimes overwhelming that there is a response uh, that our community does not have a child care center and we want to put these children, whether that they are the least of these children that are in the hands of DHS or even someone like the Landreths that are going to have 40 million children before uh, the year's up. Uh, that we can, They can be placed into the trust of the church and be lifted up and encouraged and, and, and be discipled as one and two and three and four-year-olds and that they would know Christ at a very young age. That's, our, that's, that's where our heart beats and that's in our wheelhouse, baby. We want to do stuff like that. And we want to have a conversation about that. But that's financial stuff. That's just talking about our pocketbooks. And I think that that's fine where we can, we can put money in the offering and we can cross, cross our arms and say, I hope somebody can do something good with this. Somewhere along the lines, it's got to get personal. Somewhere along the lines, this ministry of reconciliation, although that it might change our outlook of what our pocketbooks might look like and how we spend our money, somewhere along the lines, that ministry of reconciliation has got to look personal. It's got to be, would you come over and have a cup of coffee with me? Let's have this spiritual conversation about Jesus. This, this man that when I find myself in Christ that I do not regard anybody else the same way that I used to. I view relationships with other people differently. We've been given this ministry of reconciliation, and it's not a passive ministry. It's got to get personal, y'all. God changes people's lives, amen? We believe that. I don't think that there's anybody in here that would doubt that God has, the message of God Maybe even the idea of God, that if you haven't grasped that, that you have witnessed the change in people's lives because of God. It isn't a, it isn't a church program. You know, we could do the, the, the meal program and invite people in. 
And we can have lots of people, and we do have lots of people on Wednesday night to come and partake in a, in a meal. But until that it gets personal and start having conversation with those folks, it's just a meal. How many people here this morning can testify to the goodness of God because God sent someone to be in your lives and be a vocal mouthpiece or a presence that represents the kingdom of God? How many here could testify that you're a product of that? Yes. Because God sent somebody. God sent something, somebody to you, and it wasn't by accident. It was on purpose. Do you think this is a good church? This, this organization, this, this meeting, do you believe that this is a good church? Good. I'm glad that you think so because you belong to these people. God is good and you belong to his mission. Not because I say you do. Because the word tells us that he has given you this ministry. Would you partner with me and other people that have been burdened in this manner to pray that God would send someone from this church? That God would be preparing the hearts of young people's lives, old people's lives to go and be his minister? Is that a, is that a good thing to pray about? <laughs> I hope so. Would you partner with us as we pray in that manner? I believe that God right now is stirring the hearts of people and have been stirring the hearts of people. He has given you the ministry of reconciliation. He is, you are an ambassador of the kingdom of God. He will equip you to do the work that he calls you to do. Would you pray with me?